Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are going to be continuing our read through of this book, the Encyclopedia of American Indian History and Culture. There is a cat on the desk. He's very sleepy and won't move, so he is very kindly propping up the book for us. It's kind of a weird angle, but we'll work with it. He's a little sad today because he found out he could climb my bookshelf and he fell asleep on it and he rolled off while asleep. And he's fine, but it really hurt his ego, so poor little old man. <laughs> so first up in our series, we have the Alabama. The ancestors of the Alabama were southeastern mound builders who lived in villages in present-day Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida near the Gulf of Mexico. It is from this tribe that the state of Alabama takes its name. The Alabama settled near the Gulf Coast and along inland rivers and lived by fishing, farming, and hunting. Traditionally, the men would hunt deer, turkey, and small game, while the women tended to the crops of corn, beans, and squash. The Alabama enclosed their villages with palisades. Inside the villages, and unlike many other Plains tribes, the Alabama lived in houses rather than teepees. Did I say we're going over the Plains tribes today? We're, we're going over the Plains tribes today. There's a lot of them. <laughs> um, anyway, they, they lived in houses rather than teepees. They arranged their houses around a central square in which their temple stood. This was the heart of the community. In 1539, the tribe met the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto in central Alabama. De Soto's expedition brought diseases to the southeast. That devastated many tribes, including the Alabama, who lost about 95% of their population in the decades that followed. The surviving Alabama and other tribes joined forces to form the Creek Confederacy, a union in which each tribe kept its own identity. The English, Spanish, and French who explored and settled in the southeast treated the Confederacy as one group, and the Creeks used this to their advantage. They became a powerful Confederacy that traded with the Europeans and adopted some of their ways of life, including farming methods. At the same time, the Alabama and Cushanta tribes formed a close partnership of their own. The members of these tribes married, bringing the two nations even closer together. Wars between the French and the English in the 1700s drove the Alabama west to escape the conflict. In 1830, the U.S. government introduced the Indian Removal Act, forcing southeastern tribes to move to Indian Territory west of the Mississippi River in present-day Oklahoma. In the mid-1800s, a group of Alabama moved to Texas, where many Cushanta joined them. Later, another group of Alabama and Cushanta formed the Alabama Cusartan Tribal Town in Oklahoma. I don't know how to say that. Today, the Alabama, Cushanta, and Texas oversee forestry industries on their land and run campgrounds around Lake Tom, Lake Tom Bigby. Central to their spirituality is the idea of free will. To this day, the importance of an individual's freedom to choose between right and wrong lies at the heart of the elders' teaching. And next we have the Arapaho. According to tribal history, the Arapaho were once one of the largest tribal groups inhabiting the plains. They lived in what is now Colorado and Wyoming. In around 1700, the group realized that they were too large to continue living on their land without overusing its natural resources. One group, the Gros Ventre, moved to present-day Canada. The rest of the tribe stayed in the plains, but split into northern and southern Arapaho bands. By the mid-1600s, both bands were making use of wild horses, which allowed them to travel and hunt buffalo. They followed buffalo herds as they migrated, moving their camps frequently. They lived in teepees made from buffalo skins, which were easy to put up, take down, and transport. Women decorated tribal clothing, teepees, and bags using beads and designs painted in colors made from vegetable dyes. The Arapaho traded and formed friendships with some tribes, such as the Comanche, but fought with others, such as the Lakota Sioux. In the 1800s, the warring tribes came together to defend the plains from U.S. troops and white settlement. During the 1849 gold rush, 
Thousands of gold seekers and settlers traveled through Arapaho land on their way to California. Worried that they would lose their land, the Arapaho signed a treaty with the U.S. government, signing a reservation in Colorado for the Arapaho and the Cheyenne, and protecting this land from settlement by outsiders. By 1858, prospectors had found gold in Colorado. In spite of treaty promises, settlers moved on to Settlers moved on to Arapaho land, forcing the northern Arapaho farther north into Wyoming. The U.S. government placed them on a reservation with the Shoshone, and the tribe still lives on the Wind River Reservation today, farming and raising cattle. There we go. The southern Arapaho tried, but failed, to keep their lands in Colorado. The Treaty of the Little Arkansas in 1865 forced them onto reservation land, which they shared with the Cheyenne tribe in Indian Territory, now present-day Oklahoma. In 1891, the U.S. government took away most of this land, and the southern Arapaho eventually settled around Concho, Oklahoma, also in Indian Territory. Alright, next we have... The Arikara. The Arikara call themselves Sanish, which means original people from whom all other tribes spring. The Arikara were farmers growing crops of corn, beans, and squash on land along the Missouri River in South Dakota. The tribe was particularly known for its corn and grew up to nine different types. The Arikara traded surplus corn with tribes, such as the Sioux, who did not farm. In return, they received buffalo skins and meat. With European traders, they exchanged corn for utensils and cloth. The tribe hunted buffalo and antelope in winter, and used basket traps to catch fish in the river. At their peak, Arikara communities numbered thousands of people, living in homes made from wooden poles and packed earth. By the time U.S. explorers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark met the tribe in 1804, many Arikara had died from diseases introduced by European settlers. The explorers recorded about 2,000 people living in just three villages. A smallpox epidemic in 1837 wiped out many more Arikara, forcing them to rely on neighboring tribes for survival. In 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty assigned land at Fort Berthold in North Dakota for the Arikara, the Hidatsa, and Mandan people, at which point they became known as the Three Affiliated Tribes. The Fort Berthold Reservation covered more than 12 million acres when the three tribes moved there. By 1887, this had been reduced to less than 1 million acres through the Dawes Act of 1887. The tribes continued to lose their land to flooding and unfair land deals. As their land rights diminished, the tribes were forced to move away from their soil-rich farmlands and into higher dry and windy land, where they found it difficult to grow crops as successfully as they had done in the past. Today, the three affiliated tribes continue to live on the Fort Berthold Reservation. The Arikara language is endangered. Those with any knowledge of the language are age 65 and older, and no one is fluent. In 2014, the tribe started a project to revive its language through teaching programs in local schools and by developing learning tools for more advanced use of the Arikara language. Right, next we have, we forgot to go up here for a bit, the Assiniboine. Around 1600, a quarrel among the Nakota Sioux led a group within the tribe to break away and form the Assiniboine tribe. Its name comes from the Ojibwe word Asiniboan, which means stony Sioux, and may refer to the Assiniboine's method of using hot rocks to boil water. As the tribe spread onto the plains, it hunted over a territory stretching from Saskatchewan in Canada to the Missouri Valley in Montana. Family groups scattered across the region, living in temporary camps rather than in permanent villages. They used dogs to transport their belongings on a travois, a type of sled. For a time, the Assiniboines sought refuge with the Cree, who were enemies of the Nakota Sioux. Because they were spread so widely, the Assiniboine adapted their ways of living to suit their environment. 
Those living near woodlands took up the fur trade in the late 1600s and early 1700s, exchanging beaver pelts for English guns. There we go. Metal goods and cloth. Those on the plains traveled frequently to hunt and made buffalo skin bags for storing and transporting food rather than using handwoven baskets. It was not unusual for women to accompany the men when hunting to help butcher an animal once captured. Back at the camp, the women then prepared the buffalo skins for making clothes or teepees. They cut the buffalo meat and dried it for later use. Contact with European settlers brought waves of new diseases during the late 1700s and early 1800s, causing many Assiniboine to die of smallpox, measles, and whooping cough. By the late 1800s, many bands of Assiniboine had lost land in treaties with the U.S. government, while the buffalo on which they depended had been almost wiped out by white hunters and soldiers. Landless and starving, the Assiniboine moved to two reservations in Montana. Today they share land with the Sioux at the Fort Peck Reservation and a reservation at Fort Belknap with the Gros Ventre tribe. Other Assiniboine moved to reservations in Saskatchewan, Canada. Few people speak the Assiniboine language today, and it is threatened with falling out of usage. And next we have the Blackfeet. The Blackfeet, an Algonquin-speaking tribe, once controlled large areas in present-day Alberta, east of the Rocky Mountains, and Saskatchewan, both now Canadian provinces, and in Montana. They probably migrated to the plains from the northeast. The tribe is a confederacy of three main bands that emerged many centuries ago, the Siksika, the Kainai, and the Pikuni. According to tribal stories, the Siksika and the Kainai are named after a particular characteristic. For example, Siksika refers to those with black-dyed moccasins, from which this tribe's name comes, and Kainai means bloods, as that band ate berries that stained their faces and hands red. The Blackfeet were hunters who moved about the plains using dogs and sleds to carry their loads. By the mid-1700s, the tribe had obtained horses from other tribes to the south and guns from European fur traders. The Blackfeet hunted over a large territory, but the bands came together to trade and for important ceremonies, such as the sacred sun dance. The tribe followed this way of life for centuries, avoiding contact with settlers. In the 1850s, government treaties forced the Blackfeet to cede their lands. An 1855 treaty assigned the tribe a reservation in Montana, a parcel of land next to what later became Glacier National Park. Many Blackfeet people, especially descendants of the Southern Pegan Band, moved there. Other bands went to reserves in Southern Alberta, Canada. On the reservations, the Blackfeet were expected to farm instead of hunt. Trying to live by using methods that were unfamiliar to them, the tribe struggled to survive. They became dependent on the government for food, which they did not always receive. The winter of 1883 to 1884 was particularly hard and became known among the tribe as the Starvation Winter. Since that time, the Blackfeet have rebuilt their tribe and revived their language. They honor many traditions and maintain a deep respect for the land. Hunting and fishing regulations ensure that the animal populations continue to thrive. In 2014, they signed the Buffalo Treaty with other tribes pledging to work together to restore wild buffalo to the plains. And the next tribe is the Caddo. The Caddo tribe is a confederation of many bands that lived in parts of Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas. Their ancestors had farmed the Red River Valley of East Texas for around 2,000 years. As well as corn, the Caddo grew watermelons, gathered nuts such as walnuts and pecans, and made salt by boiling salty marshland water. The Caddo traded these goods with other tribes. Their main villages contained large earthen mounds on which they built grass-covered temples for the tribe's spiritual leaders. They buried important people in other mounds. Family groups lived in pole-framed houses covered with grass thatch. Members followed a clan system in which children took the name of their mother's clan, such as panther or wolf. 
the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto came across the Cado in 1541. His invading forces fought the Tula band of Cado and destroyed many of their villages. Like other tribes, the Cado suffered many losses from diseases introduced by the Europeans. Then they began to lose their territory. American settlers moved into Cado lands from the early 1800s, and in the 1830s, following the Indian Removal Act, the government began to force the Cado out of their homelands. The Cado settled on reservation land near Anadarko, Oklahoma, which was shared by Wichita and Delaware people. The Cado remain proud of their heritage. They have a National Heritage Museum and hold celebrations that include traditions such as the turkey dance, which used to mark the return of Cado warriors from battle, traditionally taking place before sunset. And next we have, here we go, the Cheyenne. The Cheyenne call themselves Tsitasetas. Si Thesetas, Si Thesetas, meaning the people. They originated in Minnesota, where they had a farming culture, but sometime before the 1700s, the tribe changed from living an agricultural life to following a more nomadic one on the plains. To some extent, the move was inspired by the large numbers of buffalo living in the plains area, but there was also pressure to move from their enemies, the Cree and Assiniboine. Instead of building earthen lodges and permanent villages, the tribe began to establish temporary camps, living in hide-covered teepees, as well as practicing their own version of the sun dance. The Cheyenne celebrated an animal dance that was to help hunters bring back enough food for the tribe. By the, 17, sorry, by the 1700s, the Cheyenne were living in parts of modern-day Colorado and Wyoming, and had split into two main bands the Northern and the Southern Cheyenne. Cheyenne society included a number of peace chiefs, one for each band of Cheyenne, who got together to discuss and decide on important issues. As well as the peace chiefs, members from several bands formed groups known as military societies. These members were charged with leading hunts, directing battle, and enforcing discipline. One such society was the Hotame Taneo dog warrior society whose members were highly skilled cheyenne warriors who played an important role in the plains wars each of these military societies had its own paraphernalia rituals and dances for example members of the dog warrior society wore a whistle made from the bone of a bird's wing around their necks they blew their whistles to give certain signals during combat the Cheyenne often fought to defend their lands. They won some battles but lost many against the much larger U.S. Army. One of the most tragic events in Cheyenne history took place in 1864, when more than 500 Southern Cheyenne, led by Chief Black Kettle, gathered for peace talks with the U.S. government. The Cheyenne, including women and children, camped at Sand Creek, Colorado, where Black Kettle flew an American flag and a white flag from his teepee to show that the tribe wanted peace. In spite of this, Colonel John Chivington led U.S. troops in a brutal attack against the encampment, killing around 150 innocent tribal members. Cheyenne warriors sought revenge, and the conflicts continued until the U.S. Army forced the Southern Cheyenne to move to Oklahoma in 1877. Meanwhile, the Northern Cheyenne fought alongside other native tribes against the U.S. government in the wars for the Black Hills. Today, almost 5,000 people occupy the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Montana, where many of them live by farming and ranching. The Southern Cheyenne share a reservation with the Arapaho in Oklahoma. The Cheyenne continue to practice a number of craft traditions, including pipe carving, woodworking, quill embroidery, and leatherworking. And next we have the Chickasaw. Although the Chickasaw people have lived in Oklahoma since the 1830s, the tribe's ancestral homes are in Mississippi, Alabama, and other parts of the Southeast. In this fertile land, the Chickasaw established large villages on high ground to avoid flooding when the Mississippi River overflowed. They built their pole-framed homes and dug out canoes from local hardwood trees. They established successful farms on the land surrounding their villages, growing corn, squash, beans, melons, and sunflowers. 
The men were also hunters and warriors, with access to three major rivers, the Mississippi, the Tombigbee, and the Tennessee, the tribe was able to travel great distances to become part of a wide trading network. In 1540, the Chickasaw met Hernando de Soto and his men. The Chickasaw welcomed the Spanish, but de Soto executed two members for stealing pigs. When the British arrived in the 1600s, the tribe established a good trading relationship with them. During the French and Indian War, the Chickasaw fought with the British against the French. By the early 1800s, the Chickasaw and other southeastern tribes became interested in European customs and ideas, including government, farming techniques, and clothing. This impressed the new American government, and along with the Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole tribes of the southeast, the Chickasaw became known as one of the five civilized tribes. When the U.S. government forced the Chickasaw to move to Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, the tribe faced a new life in a strange land. They fought attempts to make them share a reservation with the Choctaw tribe, settling on their own reservation in 1856. The Chickasaw tribe was the only one of the five civilized tribes not to retain a reservation in its original southeastern homeland. Today, the Chickasaw Nation is one of the largest tribes in the United States, with its language still spoken by a significant number. It has a strong government and runs many businesses, as well as radio and television stations. The Chickasaw Cultural Center in Sulphur, Oklahoma has a replica traditional village, art gallery, theater, and regular exhibits. And, oh, and next we have the Comanche. At some point during the, the late 1600s, the Comanche split from their relatives, the Shoshone, and became one of the most powerful tribes on the plains, expanding into large parts of Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, and Colorado. At the height of their power, the Comanche numbered more than 40,000 people spread across 12 bands. The people were nomadic hunters, who followed the buffalo herds, setting up their teepees in temporary camps and supplementing their diet with roots, nuts, and berries foraged by the women. Because they moved frequently, the tribe made lightweight baskets and leather bags rather than pottery for carrying food and equipment. They carved utensils, such as spoons from buffalo horn. The tribe owned many thousands of horses and raided and traded for even more, giving them an early advantage over some other Plains tribes. Both boys and girls learned to ride horses at a young age, so all tribal members became skillful riders and trainers. During the 1700s, the Comanche held onto their large land base and way of life. For some time, their regular raids on other tribes and Europeans deterred outsiders from moving onto their lands. But this situation did not last. In the 1800s, the Comanche were forced to unite with the Kiowa, right? Kiowa? Kiowa? I forget. It'll say it later. And other Plains people to defend their land against U.S. Army troops and settlers. Yet they lost more people to disease than to warfare. By 1867, the tribal population had dropped to fewer than 3,000 people. That year, the Comanche signed a treaty ceding 38.5 million acres of land in exchange for their own reservation money and a promise that white hunters would stop killing the buffalo. Quanah Parker, the son of a Comanche chief, led one last rebellion in 1874, but the U.S. Army forced Parker and his warriors to surrender in 1875. Today, the Comanche... Kiowa, I want to say, and we'll find out soon, and Apache tribes share reservation lands in Oklahoma. Each tribe lives in a different region of the reservation, with the Kiowa to the north, the Apache to the south, and the Comanche occupying the central territory between them. And next we have the Crow. The Crow call themselves Apsaluki, children of the large-beaked bird. Early Crow people lived near Lake Erie, but the tribe moved west several times to avoid conflict with more powerful tribes. When the Cheyenne, Cree, and other Plains tribes forced them from Lake Winnipeg, Canada, the Crow moved south to what is now southern Montana and northern Wyoming. Like other Plains people, they were primarily hunters living a nomadic life in temporary teepee camps, which they moved as they followed the buffalo. The tribe grew tobacco, which it traded along with buffalo hides. 
During a ceremony, a spiritual leader filled a pipe with tobacco and blessed it. He then passed the pipe from one participant to the next so that each could benefit from the blessing. Crow men grew their hair very long and both men and women wore colorful beaded clothing. Within the tribal community, there was great emphasis on the fathers teaching their sons such survival skills as archery and for the mothers to teach their daughters to cook and make clothes. By the mid-1700s, the Crow had horses and occupied a large territory along the Yellowstone River. In 1851, the Crow signed the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the U.S. government, through which they gained 33 million acres of reservation land, but this soon dwindled as the tribe's traditional enemies, the Cheyenne and Lakota Sioux, hunted on the lands, forcing the Crow to move. A second treaty, signed in 1868, reduced the Crow reservation to just 8 million acres. Fearful for both their safety and their land, the Crow offered to help the U.S. Army by acting as scouts during the Plains Wars. Despite their service, the Crow lost more land. Their reservation currently consists of just 2 million acres in Montana. Today, many Crow members continue to live on the res reservation, the largest in the state, where the tribe depends on farming, gas, oil, and timber. There is a push to revitalize the tribal language, and each August, the tribe hosts the Crow Fair, one of North America's biggest American Indian events. Sometimes referred to as the teepee capital of the world, because there may be as many as 1,000 teepees on display, the show provides Native families with an opportunity to gather together and celebrate their culture in a wide range of events, from rodeo to dancing and crafting. Each morning there is a parade with floats as well as people on foot or on horseback, with many people dressed in traditional ceremonial regalia. And next we have the Delaware. Delaware is the name that European colonists gave to the Lenny Lenape tribe after the Delaware River. Originally, many of the tribal people occupied land near the Delaware River in present-day southern New York and northern New Jersey. Today, the tribal community in Oklahoma continues to use the Delaware name, while other groups use the name Lenape. The tribe is one of the oldest tribes in the Northeast. The name Lenny Lenape means original people. Neighboring tribes recognized and respected the tribe's ancestry, calling them the grandfathers. At first, the Delaware welcomed European settlers, acting as scouts and soldiers for them in the early days of the United States. But as more colonists moved into their territory, the tribe could not survive as a united group and scattered into many bands, some moving into present-day Pennsylvania, others into what is now Ohio. Once in these new areas, many Delaware bands merged with other tribes, often adopting their cultures. Increasingly, members of the Delaware tribe who stayed in New Jersey and New York married non-natives, and over time many of them lost their culture and traditions. In 1758, some 200 Delaware agreed to live on the Brotherton, the first reservation in New Jersey. In September 1778, the Delaware became the first tribe to sign a treaty with the U.S. government. The Treaty of Fort Pitt, also known as the Delaware Treaty, allowed U.S. troops and their allies to pass through Delaware land. Forced by treaties to cede their land, the Delaware struggled to become self-sufficient, and by the early 1800s, most of these Delaware had moved away. One group settled in modern-day Missouri in 1793. Known as the Absentee Delaware, this group moved into Texas in 1820 and finally to Oklahoma in 1859. In Oklahoma, the tribe settled at the Wichita Reservation in 1890. At this time, the U.S. government enrolled them either as Caddo or Wichita Indians, stripping them of their true identity. From that time on, the community strived to rebuild its individual tribal status and culture. In 1977, the absentee Delaware were finally recognized as the Delaware Tribe of Oklahoma and received joint ownership of lands with the Caddo and Wichita peoples. And next we have the Crovantra. No one is sure why the Crovantra have this name, French for large belly. It may be that early French traders misunderstood the tribe's sign language. 
The tribe call themselves A'aninin, meaning white clay people. According to Gros Ventre history, the creator made white clay people to keep him company. Approximately 3,000 years ago, the Gros Ventre migrated from the coast of the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, and then to the eastern plains south of Lake Winnipeg, Canada. They lived a nomadic life, moving camp to hunt migrating buffalo for food and clothing. They excelled at making elaborate and beautiful beadwork and quillwork. At that time, the Gros Ventre and the Arapaho were one tribe, but in about 1700, the tribe split in two and the Arapaho moved south. By the early 1800s, the Gros Ventre lived in Saskatchewan, Canada, but not peacefully. Cree and Assiniboine warriors, armed with guns, preyed on the tribe, while waves of European diseases reduced its population. With fewer people and no weapons, the tribe retreated south into Montana. In their new home, the Gros Ventre all allied themselves with the Blackfeet. As settlers and miners moved west, hunting land began hunting land began to disappear, as did the buffalo, killed for sport by white hunters and targeted by government soldiers. As the buffalo died out, the Gros Ventre became dependent on food and clothing supplies from government forts. With much of their land taken over and their main food source gone in 1888, the Assiniboine, Blackfeet, and Gros Ventre ceded more than 17 million acres of land to the government and moved on to reservations. Today, the Gros Ventre share the Fort Belknap Reservation with the Assiniboine. Together, they form the Fort Belknap Indian Community Council, but each celebrate its separate culture independently. To earn income, the Gros Ventre tribe relies on agriculture, growing crops of wheat and barley, producing hay, and renting out land for ranching. There are few speakers of the tribe's native language, but it is now taught from primary age at school in order to keep it alive. Among the rituals still held by the tribe is the ceremony of the sacred flat pipe. Sacred pipes are significant religious objects for many Plains tribes, passing from one generation to the next. According to ancestral history, the flat pipe of the Gros Ventre was given to them when the world was created. Today, an annual ceremony serves to reinforce the tribe's link with its creator. And next is the Hidatsa. The Hidatsa originated in Minnesota and moved several times before settling in villages along the Missouri River in North Dakota. In their new homeland, the tribe formed close friendships with its neighbors, the Arikara and Mandan, and became part of a thriving trading center on the river, exchanging crops for meat and hides with other tribes and with Europeans. They also hunted for their own meat. Hidatsa women built the tribe's homes, circular earthen lodges made from wooden posts, packed earth, and grass. Unlike many of the nomadic plains tribes who made leather bags for the storage and transportation of their goods, the Hidatsa made pottery vessels. A smallpox epidemic in 1830 devastated the Hidatsa, Mandan, and Arikara tribes. Seeking strength and protection in numbers, the Hidatsa joined the Mandan. The Arikara joined them 20 years later. Under Hidatsa chief forebears, the three affiliated tribes formed a new village called Like a Fish Hook. Treating the three tribes as one, the U.S. government assigned them a reservation, including like a fishhook village at Fort Berthold, North Dakota, in 1870. However, the government took more and more in this land and, in the 1940s, built the Garrison Dam, flooding tribal farmland and forcing many members of the three tribes onto higher land nearby. The tribal members who remain there today work hard to preserve their languages, crafts, and traditions such as the use of the sweat house. Like a modern-day sauna, this is a hut where water is poured over hot stones to create steam. Tribal members come here to pray and cleanse through sweating. And next is the Ho-Chunk. Originally, the Ho-Chunk, or people of the big voice, lived in large villages in northeastern Wisconsin, their numbers reaching many thousands. Farmers by tradition, the Ho-Chunk lived in villages with bark lodges and grew crops of beans, corn, and squash. They also hunted buffalo and speared fish. Neighboring Ojibwa tribes called the Ho-Chunk the Winnebigu, which means people of the muddy water, because they lived by Lake Winnebago. Algae grew in the lake in summer, causing the water's muddy appearance. 
By the early 1700s, disease, starvation, and war had reduced the population to just 500. The U.S. government wanted to take over Ho-Chunk land, but this was more difficult than it expected. The tribe did not want to fight, but they were not willing to move either. Gradually, miners, traders, and others settled in the territory until, in 1837, the government introduced a treaty that gave the settlers rights over the entire area. This began years of movement for the Ho-Chunk that ended with the tribe becoming divided. Some Ho-Chunk moved to northern Wisconsin, while others were forced to move to Long Prairie, Minnesota in 1846. Their new land was at the heart of a major conflict between the Ojibwa and the Dakota Sioux tribes, and was constantly trampled over by the warring tribes. As a consequence, the tribe found it difficult to farm the land at Long Prairie, and the Ho-Chunk went on the move again, eventually settling in Nebraska. Today, the Nebraska Ho-Chunk are known as the Winnebago tribe. Winnebago Village, the largest community on their reservation, is home to around one-third of its members. The tribe's annual homecoming powwow provides an opportunity for those living off the reservation to immerse themselves in Ho-Chunk culture. The other larger group of Ho-Chunk lives in Wisconsin. Although the community has no reservation, money earned from running a successful casino has enabled the tribe to buy back about 2,000 acres of its traditional territory. They have also invested in programs preserving their heritage, such as helping the Winnebago tribe to revitalize its native language. The Ho-Chunk have also reintroduced bison to the region. And next we have the, put it up on the count there, the Iowa. The Iowa tribe calls itself ba I'm sure that's wrong, which means people of the gray snow. The name may have come from the ash-covered snow on their winter homes. The ash came from the fire inside and was carried by the smoke through the hole in the roof. Like many Plains tribes, the Iowa came from the Northeast. Having separated from their Ho-Chunk relatives, they made their home in present-day Iowa. The tribe was semi-nomadic, and people lived in villages for some of the time, while groups also moved around the tribe's territory between the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. They farmed, hunted, and fished, using both the skills of their woodland ancestors and new ones learned from life on the plains. Boys helped their fathers, who taught them to hunt deer, turkey, and raccoon from an early age. Girls helped their mothers and other women in the fields, or with food preparation. Most meals involved roasting meat or fish or making soups. Iowa people painted their faces for different reasons. Warriors applied designs and colors that would protect and inspire them in battle, while others painted their faces for ceremonies. Women wore dresses made from deer skin, which they decorated with designs made from beads or porcupine quills. They wore their hair long in braids. Men often wore nothing more than a breech cloth. For hundreds of years, the Iowa lived a good life on the plains, holding on to their lands despite attempts from other tribes to take their land from them. In the early 1800s, the U.S. government forced many southeastern tribes to move west of the Mississippi River, and it was not long before the government wanted Iowa territory for white settlers. During the 1820s and 1830s, the tribe signed several treaties ceding its territory and many Iowa moved to a reservation on the Kansas-Nebraska border. This tribe became the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Other members of the tribe went to Missouri to avoid living on this reservation, but the government relocated them to Oklahoma in 1883 to make room for more settlers. Today, the two communities are reviving their traditions. In recent years, the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma received money from the federal government to build a number of traditional homes on its land. Using the basic tools of their ancestors, including an antler rake and a bison spatula, scapula, <laughs> the bison scapula, the people constructed long houses and bark houses together. They also created an Iowa garden in which they planted crops of squash, corn, and beans. By returning to the methods of their ancestors, the Iowa have gained deeper insight into their traditional way of life. And next is the Ka. 
The Ka people are the original people of Kansas. The tribal name Kansa means people of the south wind. Ka ancestors lived on the Ohio Valley, east of the Mississippi River, but moved to Kansas and parts of Iowa, Missouri, and Nebraska sometime before the Europeans arrived. Ka people lived in permanent villages along the Kansas River, in which they built earthen lodges. Once or twice a year, the tribe would make hunting trips on the plains, traveling great distances to catch buffalo. In winter, they hunted smaller game, including beavers, deer, and turkeys. Men often wore necklaces of animal claws or beads that they traded with other tribes. Ka warriors successfully protected their tribal homeland from raiding tribes, but in the early 1800s, the U.S. government set its sights on it. In 1825, the Ka signed a treaty giving up over 18 million acres of land. Twenty years later, the tribe signed another treaty ceding two million more acres. With their population diminished by disease, the remaining Ka people moved to a small area of land near Council Grove, Kansas, while railroad companies and settlers moved onto the Ka homelands. In 1872, the U.S. government passed an act to remove the Ka tribe from Kansas completely. The Ka chief, Alagawaho, appealed to the U.S. government to allow the tribe to stay in its ancestral homeland, but his pleas did not work. The Ka had to move to a reservation in present-day Oklahoma. Today, the Ka tribe encourages its members to learn their native language and released a language app in 2016. To honor Ka history and culture, the tribe created the Alagawaho Memorial Heritage Park on the site of their ancestral village. The 168-acre park is home to the Kanza Monument, a 35-foot tower built in honor of the tribe. And next is, let's see, it is Kiowa. Kiowa. The Kiowa language links this tribe to the Pueblo people of New Mexico. Records of Spanish exploration show that the Kiowa were living on the plains by 1702. They were nomadic people who moved around a large area of present-day Oklahoma and Texas. By the early 1800s, they had become allies with their neighbors, the Comanche. Like the Comanche, the Kiowa bands traveled and hunted on horseback, following migrating buffalo herds. They built up substantial herds of horses, which they raided from Mexicans and enemy tribes. They trained some horses for their own use and traded others. The tribe was known not just for its horse trading, but also for the beautiful beaded items made by Kiowa women, including moccasins, baby carriers, and clothes trimmed with shells. Beading traditions continue today. Using tiny seed beads and slightly larger pony beads, women stitch designs onto clothing to create geometric patterns on a pair of moccasins, for example, or on a long fringe at the top of a legging. Kiowa warriors were famously brave, often fighting tribes such as the Osage, who tried to move into their territory, and opposing white settlers. The U.S. government negotiated peace among the warring tribes in the mid-1800s, but European settlers continued to invade Kiowa lands. The Treaty of Medicine Lodge in 1867 banned white hunters and promised benefits to the Kiowa if the tribe agreed to settle on a reservation. The government did not honor the treaty, however, and the Kiowa resorted to raiding in order to survive. Raids continued in Texas until 1870, and one of the most famous Kiowa warriors, Satanta, was imprisoned for his role in killing a number of men during a raid on a wagon train. He died in prison in 1878. Today, the Kiowa live in Oklahoma near the Comanche and Apache tribes. As a way of earning income, they lease much of their land for ranching, farming, and oil drilling. And next we have the Mandan. Originally from the east or the southern Great Lakes region, the Mandan tribe migrated and settled in villages along the Missouri River in around 1400. They grew crops of corn, squash, beans, and sunflowers, which they traded for fresh meat and supplies. Once a year, the tribe headed into the plains to hunt buffalo, drying much of the meat to help them survive the winters. They made round boats, called bull boats, in which to ferry their catch across the Missouri River. 
Along with the Arikara and Hidatsa tribes, the Mandan established a busy trading center that attracted tribes from all over the plains, as well as European explorers and traders using the Missouri River. The explorers Lewis and Clark found the Mandan friendly and hospitable. For much of the year, the tribe lived in villages where they built earthen lodges. These homes were partially underground and housed several related families. Mandan communities followed a clan system that was passed down through the mother. A smallpox epidemic brought on by interaction with the Europeans swept through the upper Missouri River area in 1837, killing almost all the Mandan people. The Hidatsa and Arikara suffered similar losses, so the three tribes moved close together for protection and support. In 1851, the U.S. government assigned a small area of land to the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, who then became known as the three affiliated tribes. Twenty years later, their land became the Fort Berthold Reservation, and this was reduced even further in size when the U.S. government completed the Garrison Dam on the Missouri River in 1954. The Mandans still live on the Fort Berthold Reservation with lands on both sides of the Missouri River. Some Mandan people live in Newtown, North Dakota. Next we have the Miami. There we go, make sure it's all in frame. Perfect. Originally, the Miami tribe's homelands extended over a large area of modern Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Several bands spread out across this territory, using the resources around them. They planted crops and hunted for food, and traveled frequently on the region's waterways and dug out canoes. During the spring and summer, women collected maple syrup, grew vegetables such as corn, and gathered berries. After the corn harvest, the tribe moved to winter grounds, where the men hunted buffalo and elk. In the early days of hunting, before the tribe had horses, Miami men would trap buffalo inside a ring of fire before shooting at them with their bows and arrows. Often the women and children of the tribe would accompany the men on the hunt to prepare the hides and meat for transporting back to the village. This life continued well into the 1600s, at which point the Miami formed close relationships with French explorers, traders, and missionaries. After 1673, the British took ownership of French territory in North America, and the Miami then began trading with them. During the Revolutionary War, the Miami fought alongside the British against the Patriots. When the British lost, the Miami continued to fight against the United States and against white settlers encroaching on their territory. The Miami tribe and its native allies won several victories against U.S. troops in the 1700s, but they met with catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794 and were forced to sign the Treaty of Greenville, along with other tribes. The treaty ceded, slide this down a little against the cat, the treaty ceded all Miami lands to the government. In 1840, the Indian Removal Act forced the Miami to move to present-day Kansas and then to present-day Oklahoma in 1867. Some tribal members stayed behind in Kansas and are now known as the Miami Nation of Indiana. Today, members of the Miami tribe live all over the United States. Although the Miami tribe of Oklahoma is the only Miami community to have federal recognition, on their reservation they raise cattle and look after pecan groves on 1,000 acres of land. The tribe practices and teaches its language and arts across the country. In 2001, the tribe started the Miami Project, now the Miami Center, an educational and research organization working with the University of Miami in Oxford, Ohio. Alright, and next we have the Modoc. The Modoc lived on about 5,000 square miles of mountains, forests, flatlands, and lava beds in what is now southern Oregon and northern California. Semi-nomadic, the small tribe moved between the best fishing, foraging, and hunting grounds and defended their land against raiding tribes such as the Klamath to the south. There were three bands within the tribe, the Gumbatwa, the people of the west, Paskanwa, the river people, and the Kokiwa, the people of the far out country. They worked with European fur traders and later befriended settlers and ranchers. 
Finding the ways of the newcomers appealing, the Modoc began wearing European-style clothes and taking non-native names. One chief, Kiantpus, became known as Captain Jack. As more white settlers moved onto Modoc lands, the U.S. government forced the peaceful tribe to sign a treaty in 1864 that ceded their lands. The government assigned reservation land for the Modoc and the Klamath, who had also given up their land. The reservation did not have nearly enough resources for both tribes, and when tensions arose, Captain Jack decided to lead a small band of Modoc back to their ancestral land by the Lost River in Northern California. The government sent troops to return the group to the reservation, and this led to the Modoc War in 1872. The small group fought off the U.S. Army for eight months, but surrendered in 1873. The government hanged the leaders, including Captain Jack, and sent the remaining Modoc to Oklahoma. In 1891, just 68 tribal members remained, and in the 1950s, the Modoc lost their tribal status as a result of the government's termination policy. It was restored in 1978. Today, the small but proud Modoc tribe of Oklahoma guards its heritage. In recent years, Modoc ranchers have reintroduced buffalo to their 600-acre Modoc reservation. And then we have the Omaha. The Omaha, Kansa, Osage, Ponca, and Quapa were once one people. Separating from the group in about 1600, the Omaha moved to an area in what is now northwestern Iowa, where they developed their own language and culture. There were two groups within the tribe, the Insta Shunda, Sky People, and the Honga Shenu, Earth People. The Sky People looked after the tribe's spiritual needs, while the Earth People took care of their physical needs, such as food and shelter. In Iowa, they built winter villages. Families lived together in earthen houses arranged in a circle around a central plaza. The tribe fished in rivers, but also depended on beans and several varieties of corn and other crops. Once they had horses, they could travel farther away to catch buffalo. During the 1700s, the Omaha cultivated a good trading relationship with the French, and later with the Spanish. When raiding Sioux parties forced them to move into present-day Nebraska, they traded goods from a large village they established called Tonwatonga. The relationship with the Europeans led to a devastating smallpox epidemic which killed many members of the tribe. From 1831 to 1854, the Omaha signed treaties ceding their land to the U.S. government. The last treaty assigned a reservation for the tribe in Thurston County, Nebraska. Today, the Omaha Nation manages a farm and a recreation and hunting ground on its reservation lands. And next we have the Osage. I don't think I can fit this all in the frame. The cat is slowly rolling away from me. Anyway, the Osage. The Osage fought against the Iroquois Confederacy for many years until finally moving west from the Ohio River Valley, breaking away from a larger group that included the Ponca, Kansa, Omaha, and Quapa. The Osage settled over parts of present-day Arkansas, Kansas, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. The tribe lived a semi-nomadic, mostly agricultural life. They planted and harvested crops in the land surrounding their villages, and once or twice a year, headed onto the plains to hunt buffalo. Each village had a war chief and a peace chief. Inside their villages, they built pole-framed longhouses with hide or woven mat coverings. The tribe had horses and harvested a wood called Osage Orange after the tribe, which was ideal for making bows. The Osage tribe formed a strong relationship with French traders, exchanging furs for guns and other European goods. When the French fought the Algonquian tribes to the east, Osage warriors joined them, and in 1725 the French brought some Osage chiefs and warriors to Paris. The tribe was less welcoming to the Spanish, who arrived in the mid-1700s, and whom they saw as a threat to the French. The Spanish had to employ French traders as go-betweens with the tribe. After the Revolutionary War, the new U.S. government sought to extend its control in the West. The Osage signed three treaties in 1808, 1818, and 1825, ceding much of their land. The treaty signed in 1825 allocated a site in Kansas for the tribe, 
but the terrible conditions there deprived the tribe of its traditional food sources and medicines. The Drum Creek Treaty of 1868 brought further land losses, and in 1870, the Osage sold their there we go their land in Kansas to buy land in Oklahoma where they could make a new start. In 1879, oil was found on the Osage Reservation. Although this led to a huge upsurge in the Osage economy, many tribal members were cheated out of money and land during the boom. Today, the tribe oversees the resources on its land and other businesses. Among the ancient traditions still upheld by the tribe today is the In Longshka dance, which involves the coming together of three drums, one from each of three families, each played by an eldest son. The event is marked by drumming, dancing, and singing of songs passed down through the generations. Let's see, next we have... I told you there's a lot. we have the Oto Missouria. The Oto Missouria existed originally as two separate tribes in the Great Lakes area. The Oto lived on the present-day border of Minnesota and Iowa, <laughs> while the Missouria were based in present-day Missouri. The Oto moved farther south into Nebraska, where they adapted to a life on the plains and began trading with the French. Meanwhile, the Missouri farmed, hunted, and traded along the Platte River. The two tribes lived separately until the early 1800s. By this time, the Missouri had suffered many attacks by the Sac and Fox tribes, including one ambush that killed many people. Soon after this, smallpox broke out in Missouri villages. Some survivors moved to Osage and Caw villages, but most decided to join the Oto tribe. Settling in permanent villages, the tribes built earthen lodges and followed the seasons for planting crops and harvesting. The men made two buffalo hunting trips a year. American settlers began moving into Oto, Missouri land in the 1800s. Under pressure from the U.S. government, the Oto, Missouri signed their first treaty in 1830. Another treaty in 1854 signed a reservation for the tribe on the Big Blue River on the Kansas-Nebraska border. Having lost both their land and their way of life, the Oto Missouri struggled to survive. They were expected to farm instead of hunt, and government support and supplies did not arrive as promised. In 1881, the tribe split into two groups, the Quaker Band, who had converted to the Quaker religion, and the Coyote Band, who continued to follow traditional spiritual practices. The Quaker Band sold land in order to buy a reservation in Oklahoma, where the Coyote Band later joined them. The two bands are now reunited as the Oto Missouri tribe and gained official tribal status in 1984. And next is the Pawnee. Four separate bands made up the Pawnee Nation of the Central Plains Chawi, Grand, Kitkahaki, or Republican, Pita Harirata, Noisy, and Skidi, Wolf. The Pawnee tribe numbered about 12,000 people, divided into bands that lived in their own villages across large parts of present-day Nebraska and Kansas. In their villages, the Pawnee lived in large family groups in earthen lodges. They grew corn and other crops. In fall, after the harvest, village groups moved across the plains to hunt, traveling far once they had acquired horses. As in other Plains tribes, Pawnee women decorated buffalo skin clothing with porcupine quills. They also made pottery from clay that they took from riverbeds and scratched decorations into the surface using tools made from animal bones. Despite their large population, the Pawnee had to defend their lands against attacks from other tribes, such as the Lakota Sioux. They were friendly to all Europeans and traded with the Spanish, French, and British. Following the Revolutionary War and the Louisiana Purchase, American settlers started moving into the West, encroaching on Pawnee territory. Between 1818 and 1875, the Pawnee signed a number of treaties that ceded most of their land to the U.S. government. In spite of this, the Pawnee remained friendly toward the United States, even acting as scouts for the U.S. Army during the Civil War and in later wars against the Sioux. After the last treaty in 1875, the U.S. government assigned a small reservation for the Pawnee in Nebraska. 
By then, the tribe was much smaller and an easy target for the Lakota Sioux, who continued to attack. In 1875, the Pawnee moved to Oklahoma, where the four bands still live together. At the Pawnee Indian Museum State Historic Site in Kansas stands a reconstructed village from the 1700s. In 2016, the Oklahoma Military Hall of Fame inducted the Pawnee Code Talkers for their help during World War II. The servicemen had used their native language to send secret coded information. Right, next is the Peoria. The ancestors of the Peoria belonged to the Illinois Confederacy, which also included the Kaskaskia, yes, Wea, Piankasha, and Tamaroa tribes. By the 1600s, having migrated from the coast of the Atlantic Ocean to the southern Great Lakes, the Peoria were living in present-day Illinois. French explorers met the tribe in the 1670s and named them Peoria for the tribal name Peoria. It means he comes carrying a pack on his back and probably relates to packs the tribe carried when traveling to hunt buffalo. This early meeting with the Europeans led to a long trading relationship. After 1763, the British took control of the French forts and some Peoria moved to present-day Missouri. Others stayed where they were, but in 1832, the tribe signed the Treaty of Louisville, giving up lands in Illinois and Missouri to the U.S. government. After the treaty, the Peoria moved to a reservation in Kansas with their cousins, the Kaskaskia, Piankisha, and Wea tribes, who also became known as the Peoria. In 1867, the tribe signed another treaty, agreeing to move to Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. The tribe bought land there and settled in the northeast of the territory. After regaining their tribal status in 1978, the Peoria tribe of Native Americans focused on strengthening its identity and culture. Today, the Peoria own a golf course and other businesses and are working to revive their language. Next is the Plains Cree. The Plains Cree are related to several other Cree tribes, including the Cree of Subarctic Canada. They all used to belong to one group living in the Subarctic region. Over time, the Plains Cree split off from this main group and migrated west, settling in hundreds of villages across what is now central Canada and the northern United States. Plains Cree people who moved to northern Minnesota increased their power and territory by joining with the Assiniboine and Ojibwa. Gradually, the tribe lost its woodland hunter-gatherer lifestyle and adapted to the environment of the Plains. The Plains Cree roamed over such a large territory that they did not have a central government under one leader. Instead, they chose war chiefs and had a society of bravest warriors called, let's see, Okichitatawak, Okichitatawak, worthy young men. Their war chiefs usually earned their high positions in tribal society by being the best hunters and decision makers. Like other Plains tribes, the Cree used horses for covering large distances and the buffalo became their main source of food. It was customary to eat the more perishable parts of the buffalo first, heart, tongue, and kidneys. The shoulder was also prized and eaten first. The rest of the meat would be cut into strips for drying. Plains people, including the Cree, made pemmican, a high-energy mixture of dried meat, berries, and animal fat that was very nutritious and lasted a long time. Because the Cree were so scattered, some bands avoided disease, settlers, and land takeovers for many years. However, this changed in the late 1800s, when the buffalo were almost wiped out, endangering the Cree way of life. Many Cree eventually settled on or off reserves in Canada. In the United States, the Cree were forced to move with the Ojibwa to the Turtle Mountain Reservation in North Dakota, where Cree people still live today. At the same time, many Cree remained landless in Montana. Today, the Rocky Boy Reservation in Montana is home to a community of Cree and Chippewa people. And next we have the Ponca. The Ponca, Omaha, Kansa, Osage, and Kwapa tribes all share common ancestors. The five tribes separated around 1600 and moved into several different areas. 
The Ponca settled close to their cousins, the Omaha, along the upper Missouri River. Living in earthen lodges, the Ponca farmed the fertile banks of the river, growing crops of squash, corn, beans, pumpkins, and tobacco. Twice a year, members of the tribe traveled onto the plains to hunt buffalo together. Culturally, the Ponca were similar to the Omaha in that they had hereditary chiefs and operated a clan system passed down through a father. Among their celebrations and ceremonies was the sacred pipe ceremony still practiced today in order to create a link between the earthly and spiritual worlds. Among their crafts were pottery pieces and willow or rush baskets. The tribe was traditionally small, numbering only about 800 people. Larger tribes, especially the Sioux, took advantage of this and frequently raided the Ponca, stealing the few supplies they had. Like other tribes along the Missouri River, the Ponca engaged in the fur trade in the 1700s. They also experienced the smallpox epidemics that took many lives. When the explorers Lewis and Clark met the Ponca in 1804, they estimated that the tribe numbered just 200 people. Still facing pressure from Sioux raids, the Ponca signed their first treaty with the U.S. government in 1817. Although this was an agreement of friendship and peace, Subsequent treaties in 1825, 1858, and 1865 took away Ponca land. The government agreed to provide a reservation for the Ponca on the Neobrower River, which runs through present-day Nebraska and Wyoming, a site the tribe chose for themselves. This became a problem, however, when the government signed the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux in 1868. The treaty reassigned the land given to the Ponca to the Sioux. The government decided that the Ponca should move to present-day Oklahoma rather than face a fight with the Sioux. Despite this, for almost 10 years, the Ponca held on in, held on in Nebraska. Finally, in 1877, the U.S. Army forced the tribe to leave for Oklahoma. After Chief Standing Bear's protest, the government assigned a reservation in Nebraska. Some Ponca moved there and others stayed in Oklahoma. And next is the Quapa. In about 1200, the Quapa moved to present-day Arkansas from the Ohio River Valley. For about 300 years, this, was, this small tribe enjoyed a rich life there. They lived in villages along the Mississippi River near the Arkansas River. Their name comes from a word meaning downstream people. In this area, they developed a successful farming culture. They also forged good trading relationships with other tribes such as the Chickasaw and the Tunica. The Tunica on the opposite bank of the Mississippi River. Like other Mississippi tribes, the Quapa lived in palisaded or fenced in villages where they built mounds in which to bury important members of the tribe and for the temples. The tribe was known for its pottery, particularly animal-shaped and head-shaped pots. This guy, it's cool. Once the Quapa acquired horses, they hunted buffalo on the plains. Like many tribes of the plains and other regions, the Quapa followed a clan system that continues to operate today. Within society, there are sky people, whose clans include the fish and the turtle, and earth people, whose clans include the serpent, the elk, the crawfish, and the wolf. Each clan has its own responsibilities, with children inheriting their father's clan. The Spanish who met the Quapa in the mid-1500s distributed the settled life by bringing disease to the tribe. Although many died, the tribe managed to survive and gradually became strong again. Over a century later, they welcomed French traders and missionaries and formed a special bond with them. Many Quapa converted to Catholicism. After signing treaties in the 1800s, the Quapa ceded their lands in Arkansas to the U.S. government and moved to a reservation in present-day Oklahoma. The tribe now owns a cattle company, raising cattle and buffalo, as well as gaming and tourism facilities. Elders have passed down the oral history of the tribe, and there are regular language lessons for children. In addition, an online resource includes a Quapa dictionary and historical accounts of tribal life. Next we have the Sac and Fox. Originally, the Sac and Fox tribes were related to, but independent from, tribes from the Northeast. 
The Sac, who call themselves Osakiwag, people of the Yellow Earth, lived in present-day Wisconsin. They followed a semi-nomadic lifestyle. In the summer, they lived in bark-covered wigwams in villages and fished in local rivers. In winter, they went out hunting on the prairies of the Mississippi Valley, where they built temporary reed-covered wigwams on their campgrounds for shelter. The fox, who called themselves Meshquakihug, people of the Red Earth, came from an area around present-day Green Bay, Wisconsin. The French called the Meshquakihug fox after one of the tribe's most powerful clans, which lived along the Fox River, a route for French traders. The French were close to the Ojibwa tribe, who were enemies of the Fox, and in 1690, a long war began between the Fox and the French, who were aided by the Ojibwa and Dakota Sioux. The French and their allies attacked again and again, reducing the Fox population from 20,000 to just 500 by 1734. The tribe had no option but to unite with the Sac for protection. The Sac and Fox signed a treaty with the U.S. government in 1825, but they intended to keep hold of most of their lands. However, after the Black Hawk Rebellion in 1832, the U.S. government forced the tribe to cede even more land than they originally agreed to and to move west. In 1842, some Sac and Fox people agreed to live on a reservation in Kansas, while others returned to Iowa and moved to Mexico to live with other tribes. In 1867, the government moved the Kansas community to a new reservation in Oklahoma. The tribe now lives in communities in Oklahoma, Iowa, and elsewhere. Besides holding an annual powwow, tribal members on the Sac and Fox Reservation in Oklahoma continue to observe ancient traditions, holding ceremonies to celebrate clan feasts, the naming of newborn babies, and funerals. They also have an extensive online SAC dictionary. And next is the Shawnee. Here we go. Three bands of the Shawnee tribe live in Oklahoma today. The Eastern Shawnee, the Loyal Shawnee, and the Absentee Shawnee. Another band, the Shawnee Nation United Remnant Band, lives in Ohio but does not have federal tribal status. These separate communities developed after years of attempted takeover from settlers and other tribes, as well as war and treaties. Originally, the Shawnee tribe lived in two major bands on either side of the Appalachian Mountains, from Tennessee to South Carolina. The men traveled long distances to hunt, while the women grew crops. They lived in wigwams, circular shelters made from wooden poles covered with birch bark or hides. As English settlers moved into their territory in the late 1600s, the Shawnee moved north to, into the Ohio Valley and Pennsylvania. In the 1700s, des desperate to protect their lands and their people, the Shawnee became involved in the struggle for control over North America. Many Shawnee warriors joined the French to fight against the British in the French and Indian War. Later, they fought with the British in the Revolutionary War, hoping their loyalty would help save their homelands if the British won. When the British lost the war, the Shawnee joined other tribes to, in, to defend the Ohio Valley against the Americans, who wanted to settle on their lands. In 1791, Chief Blue Jacket led his warriors to victory at the Battle of the Wabash, but the U.S. Army defeated the Shawnee and others that same year. The Treaty of Greenville in 1795 ceded much of Ohio to the U.S. government. Some Shawnee fled to live with other tribes. In 1831, the remaining Ohio Shawnee signed another treaty with the U.S. government and agreed to move to a reservation in Oklahoma. Two other Shawnee communities also moved to Oklahoma. These groups went on to become the Eastern Shawnee and Absentee Shawnee tribes. <laughs> Cats awake. And next we have the Sioux. I'm just gonna... there we go. That works for now. French fur trappers began using the word Sioux after hearing a longer but similar Ojibwa word, Nadu is Sioux, which means little snake or enemy. A large tribal group, the Sioux has three major groups, the Dakota in the east, the central Nakota, and the Lakota to the west. Each of these groups had a number of bands, 
The Lakota were the largest group, and by the end of the 1700s had divided into seven bands, extending into present-day Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. Since the Sioux lived over such a wide area, their lifestyles varied. The Eastern Sioux depended on fishing, farming, and harvesting wild rice, while the Western Sioux hunted. Once the Lakota started using horses, they commanded their vast territory with ease, raiding other tribes and hunting buffalo across the western plains. As in other tribal communities, responsibilities were divided between the men and the women. Men made tools and weapons and took part in hunting, while women foraged for wild plants such as prairie turnips, and did most of the cooking and sewing. Children might be given tasks that included fetching firewood or looking after the tribe's dogs. During the 1700s, the Eastern Sioux traded with the French and then the British, leading them to support the British in the Revolutionary War in the hope of maintaining their trading relationship. They did the same in the War of 1812, leading some Sioux to move north to Canada, which the British still controlled. The Sioux who remained faced some of the most violent conflicts of the century including the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862, Red Cloud's War, and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. After these wars, treaties, and removal acts confined the Sioux to reservation land. The Sioux tribe's fight for its lands and freedom ended on December 29, 1890, when U.S. troops invaded and killed hundreds of Sioux warriors, women, and children at Wounded Knee Creek on the Lakota Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Today, there are Sioux communities in many U.S. states and in Canada. Reservations on the plains include the Yankton Reservation, Standing Rock Reservation, Lower Brule Indian Reservation, and Crow Creek Reservation. Besides the large expanses of wild territory, there are numerous attractions that include monuments, museums, and trails. There goes the cat. Dedicated to the tribe's cultural history they still celebrate the traditions of their ancestors. All right, I've lost the cat. Let me move the camera real quick to a better angle. Next we have the Tonkawa. The Tonkawa may once have numbered 5,000 people at the height of their strength. By the 1700s, the tribe had acquired horses and used them to hunt buffalo and other game across its homelands in Texas and Oklahoma. They also gathered pecan nuts, acorns, roots, seeds, and fruit, and caught fish. Traveling much of the time, the Tonkawa made small shelters from branches and shrubbery. There's the cat drinking water now that he's awake. Among the crafts of the Tonkawa were clay pots and woven baskets. They also made rattles from gourds and drums with deer skin stretched over a hoop. The Tonkawa spoke a language that was not related to other native languages, and so it is unclear where the tribe originated. They were fierce warriors and raided Apache villages. The Apache fought back with raids of their own, and since the Tonkawa were the smaller tribe, the Apache took over their hunting grounds. By the mid-1700s, diseases introduced by Spanish missionaries were taking their toll on the Tonkawa too. When American settlers began arriving in Texas in the 1800s, the Tonkawa were friendly. The Americans created two reservations near the Brazos River in West Texas, to which the Tonkawa moved in 1855. By the time the Civil War started in 1861, native tribes took sides, choosing either to support the Union or the Confederacy. The Tonkawa warriors fought for the Confederacy, and after the war, their rule brought revenge from tribes who had fought alongside the Union. Raiding warriors attacked Tonkawa communities, cutting their population in half. The survivors stayed in Texas until the 1880s, but the U.S. government forced them to move to Oklahoma in 1884. Today, the Tonkawa Reservation consists of 1,000 acres of land in the northern part of the state. Sadly, the Tonkawa language is no longer used, as the last Tonkawa speaker died in the 1960s. Today, there are various efforts to revive the language using several online resources, which include language booklets, language lessons, and traditional stories passed down through the generations. And next is the Wichita. The Wichita lived on the Southern Plains in what became the states of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. The people call themselves 
Kitty Kittish, which means raccoon eyes because of the tattoos on the men's faces around their eyes. The name Wichita now refers to the entire tribe, but it is also the name of one of the four major bands, the others of the Taiovaya, Tawakoni, and Waco. Communities of Wichita lived in villages across their territory. Their homes were quite different from those of other Plains tribes and had beehive-shaped wooden frames, which were then covered entirely in grass. The tribe grew large crops of corn, beans, and squash and hunted buffalo, deer, and small game. Typically, the men made large-scale hunting trips in fall and winter. When the Spanish explorer Francisco Vasquez de Coronado met the Wichita in 1541, they had successful trading relationships with neighboring tribes. In time, the Wichita expanded the network to include the Spanish and later the French. They soon had access to many European goods. such as tools, which they either kept for themselves or traded with other tribes. Oh, can you see? There we go. The cat's coming back. Their contact with the Europeans brought diseases and warfare, decreasing the population by thousands. After the 1830s, the U.S. government sent many tribes living east of Wichita Territory to present-day Oklahoma. White settlers soon moved in, setting up homesteads on the Wichita's ancestral lands. Over the following decades, the Wichita were forced to move to a reservation in Texas. Then, I love you too, kitty, but you got it. Okay, you can look at my hand over here. How's that? There we go. Then back to Kansas and finally to a reservation in Oklahoma, where they stayed since 1872. There we go. Ouch. Together with the Pawnee, they work hard to keep their heritage alive, hold, including holding classes on language and native crafts such as basket weaving. Every year, the two tribes camp together to honor their histories and cultures. The 10-day powwow includes a pipe ceremony, shared meals, and songs. And next we have <laughs> a cat. Next we have the cat again, and next we have, and I think last, I believe so, let me move the cat to see, yeah, it's the last tribe we have, the Wyandotte. The Wyandotte ancestors lived in the woodlands of the northeast in present-day Ontario and Quebec, Canada. In the mid, <laughs> left-handed now so the cat can look at me. In the mid-1600s, the Iroquois Confederacy attacked people from the Wendat, or Huron Confederacy, along with the Atignawantan and Kionotateronon tribes. Wow, that's a mouthful. The powerful Iroquois wanted to expand their territory and to control the fur trade. Their aggression forced their victims to flee and join forces to become the Wyandotte tribes. The tribe first went to Mackinac Island, Michigan. Wyandotte means island dweller. From there, the tribe moved close to the French fort at present-day Detroit. Other tribal members moved into Wisconsin and to the Ohio Valley in their new lands. In their new lands, the Wyandotte continued to hunt and fish as they had always done, but also started growing corn, squash, sunflowers, and tobacco. They built longhouses with wooden frames covered in bark, often elm, and made birch bark canoes for navigating rivers and streams. They used hooks made from animal bone to catch fish and snares for bears and beavers. They also traded with other tribes and French colonists. The Wyandotte began to lose their new lands in the late 1700s. At the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, Wyandotte warriors fought with the Shawnee, Miami, and others against the U.S. Army. The Army defeated the tribes, forcing them to sign the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. This ceded land in Michigan, Ohio, and Illinois to the U.S. government. By 1862, the Wyandotte were landless and forced to move to Kansas, where they bought some land from the Lenape tribe. After white settlers began to move into the area, another treaty in 1855 took away the Wyandotte's tribal status and its land following the U.S. government's termination policy. 
Some tribal members volunteered to move to Oklahoma to live among other tribes. The Oklahoma Wyandotte eventually received money to buy land, and the government officially recognized the group as the Wyandotte Tribe of Oklahoma in 1937. These are some, you know, the stories going around now about children's bodies being found at these, like, assimilation schools. And these are some boys forced to attend boarding school to adopt white American ways of living. A great tragedy, but anyway, thank you so much for watching. Let me close the book. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night. Good night and good night.